I'd like you to picture something. Our company is situated on an out-of-town industrial estate in a warehouse between the abattoir and a garbage dump. I know, the glamour, bear with me. So it might seem an unlikely place for a happiness revolution, but it's where one happened and where it's still happening today. We had discovered that there was this proven correlation between happiness and productivity. And that seemed like a pretty fun idea in business strategy terms. And so we decided we were going to do something about that. But that was kind of a challenge, not least because of the abattoir garbage dump situation we were quite literally sitting in, but also because we didn't have much of a budget. And at the time, we didn't have much buy-in either. But we were utterly convinced that there was a way to make our employees more productive and more efficient. And if creating happiness was the key to doing that, then why the heck not give it a shot? But of course, the burning question was, how on earth are we actually going to go about creating all this happiness? How were we going to create employees who sprung out of bed in the morning, excited and inspired by the thought of going to work? And would it work? Would we see these positive outcomes on growth and on the bottom line? Well, we had three ideas about where we could make an immediate impact, and those are what I'd like to share with you today. And the first of those, absolute top priority, was bean bags. <laughs> Seriously, we spent money we didn't have and buy-in we barely had on bean bags and a beer fridge. And it was amazing. No, sorry, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was a disaster. It failed miserably. And in fact, I'm not sure those beanbags have ever been sat upon. Now, the beers got drunk very quickly. But spoiler alert, beer doesn't lead to eternal happiness either. So instead, we decided we were going to sit down with our people and we were simply going to ask them what would make them happier, or rather, what was stressing the heck out of them? What were the happiness blockers? And was there any way we could help with those? And this time, what came out really was incredible. Credit card debts that, in business terms, were insignificant, but that were dragging people down every single day and making them miserable. The first time a member of staff stood up and said, I'd love to imagine living a life free of debt. And we saw how simply saying it, just sharing it, had lifted some of that burden. And we realized immediately the impact we could make by following a happiness first philosophy. These happiness blockers were not being able to do school pickup at all during the week or worrying about how to handle childcare on an inset day. They were often things as simple as how to fit in exercise to a one hour lunch break, find time for healthy meal prep, or to support the charities that mattered to them. But once we knew about them, we were able to address them and maybe change them. Taking on a small loan and eliminating that interest overnight changed people's lives. We realized that we could alleviate stress and create happiness in the most simple of ways and not a ping pong table in sight. I was a bit gutted about that because the ping pong table had been top of my beanbag list, but hey ho. So for the second idea we had, I'd like you to picture the industrial estate again. And I'd like you to picture a meeting room. And the meeting room's full of drivers and warehousemen at the end of a long, cold, and physically demanding day that had most likely started before dawn. At the head of the table is the manager. The manager stands up, goes through what happened last week, what went well, what went badly, what's going to be done the next week, how they're going to do it, and when it's going to be done by. And at the end of the meeting, the manager says, right, anyone got any feedback? Any input? Anyone? Mick? Dave? Anything to say? No. OK, all in agreement then. Begrudging nods followed by trudging feet. And once downstairs, away from the meeting room, the voices speak up. It's a terrible idea. 
it's never going to work. We'd have done it this way. Why didn't they ask us? We've all been in those meetings at some point in our lives. These are not meetings full of happy, engaged people. And we thought, why on earth not? Why are they not engaged? Hang on a minute. Why are managers always leading these meetings? Why are we not rotating the chair of this meeting week on week and sharing the task of holding each other accountable for our commitments and for taking responsibility like grown-ups? And when we finally stop treating our people like toddlers and telling them what to do, and instead gave them the vision of where we needed to be and asked them how to get there, well, guess what? They responded in kind by stepping up and taking responsibility, like grown-ups. And by engaging them, by treating them like grown-ups, what we ultimately found was that we needed less people to perform a greater quantity of better quality work. And finally, our third idea. This was well-being. Now, the correlation between healthy behaviours and happiness is well substantiated. So this one seemed like an absolute no-brainer to us. So we thought, right, we're going to model the behaviours we'd like to see. This is easy. We're going to start by doing the top five healthy habits every highly successful leader does before dawn. You can probably guess where I'm going with this. We overslept. <laughs> we didn't manage so much as one of these habits before dawn. So we thought, right, we've learned from the beanbags, we've learned from this. And what we decided to do was to put well-being on the agenda, literally. Because in our weekly meetings, we were already asking all our people to stand up and score themselves out of 10 for their personal and their professional lives. And then we added well-being. And at first, it was a bit of a joke. But it was uncomfortably funny how somebody had had three takeaway dinners last week instead of four, five pints of beer on the Friday night instead of eight. But very soon, the inescapability of standing up and facing up to your own well-being week after week in front of a group of your peers began to have an impact. It started with small things, going to bed an hour earlier each night, walking or cycling to work, buying a fitness tracker, cutting out the amount of sugar in tea or coffee. But then it developed and progressed more rapidly and more dramatically than we could ever have hoped, to the point where we had a driver who weighed well over 20 stone, hadn't been on a bicycle since he was 10 years old, setting himself the challenge of cycling 25 miles for one of our charity events. When we care about people, we care about their well-being, both physical and mental, and we're unapologetic about that. So when this started to work, the effects didn't just stay at work, they went home and then they flowed back again. A culture of well-being is infectious. You simply have to plant the seed and be unapologetic about it. So I'd like to summarise here today by just giving you some of the stats on this, in case you weren't aware quite how serious the situation is. Official UK figures show that currently only 8% of our workforce get out of bed in the morning, go to work and engage with their organisation and its objectives. National employee engagement sits at 8%. Concurrently, our workforce is one of the least productive globally. And growth has stagnated for the past decade, leading the chief economist to label this the productivity puzzle. So seemingly, we are not taking advantage of this correlation between happiness and productivity. We are not dedicating people and resources to, it, to this cause or prioritizing it sufficiently within our strategies or our organizations. And we should be, because seizing this advantage allowed us to gain a competitive advantage in a market where, and a future, where attracting and retaining talent is one of the biggest challenges that employers need to face up to now. Doing all this had a massive effect on our staff happiness, so much so that they voted us the sixth best small company to work for 
in the national newspaper, the Sunday Times annual awards. In business terms, our, uh, our profit and our turnover grew year on year, whilst we maintained the same staff numbers. A small team of happy and engaged people. So you might be a corporate, an entrepreneur, an SME, a charity. You might have a glamorous location going for you or a sexy industry. Or you too might be between an abattoir and the garbage dump. But if we can achieve a happiness revolution, so can you. And all it costs is to care. Thank you.